Anne's House of Dreams by L. M. Montgomery. Chapter One, in the garage of Green Gables. Thanks be, I'm done with geometry, learning or teaching it, said Anne Shirley, a trifle vindictively as she dumped a somewhat battered volume of Euclid into a big chest of books, banged the lid in triumph and sat down upon it, looking at Diana Wright across the Green Gables garret with gray eyes that were like a morning sky. The garret was a shadowy, suggestive, delightful place, as all garrets should be. Through the open window by which Anne sat blew the sweet, scented, sun-warm air of the August afternoon. Outside, poplar boughs rustled and tossed in the wind. Beyond them were the woods where Lover's Lane wound its enchanted path, and the old apple orchard, while still, which still bore its rosy harvests munificently. And over all was a great mountain range of snowy clouds in the blue southern sky, through the other window was glimpsed a distant white-capped blue sea, the beautiful St. Lawrence Gulf on which floats like a jewel a begweight, whose softer, sweeter Indian name has long been forsaken for the more prosaic one of Prince Edward Island. Diana Wright, three years older than when we last saw her, had grown somewhat matronly in the intervening time, but her eyes were as black and brilliant, her cheeks as rosy, and her dimples as enchanting as in the long day in the long ago days when she and Anne Shirley had vowed eternal friendship in the garden at Orchard Slope. In her arms, she held a small sleeping black curled creature who for two happy years had been known to the world of Avonlea as small Anne Cordelia. Avonlea folks knew why Diana had called her Anne, of course, but Avonlea folks were puzzled by the Cordelia. There had never been a Cordelia in the right or buried connections. Mrs. Harmon Andrews said she supposed Diana had found the name in some trashy novel and wondered that Fred hadn't more sense than to allow it. But Diana and Anne smiled at each other. They knew how small Anne Cordelia had come by her name. You've always hated geometry, said Diana with a re retrospective smile. I should think you'd be real glad to be through with teaching anyhow. Oh, I've always liked teaching, apart from geometry. These past three years in Summerside have been very pleasant ones. Mrs. Harmon Andrews told me when I came home that I wouldn't likely find married life as much better than teaching as I'd expected. Evidently, Mrs. Harmon is of Hamlet's opinion that it may be better to bear the ills that we have than fly to others that we know not of. Anne's, lie, <clears throat> Anne's laugh, as blithe and irresistible as of yore, with an added note of sweetness and maturity, rang through the garret. Merlin, in the kitchen below, compounding blue plum preserve, heard it and smiled then sighed to think how seldom that dear laugh would echo through green gables in the years to come. Nothing in her life had ever given Marilla so much happiness as the knowledge that Anne was going to marry Gilbert Blythe, but every joy must bring with it its little shadow of sorrow. During the three summerside years, Anne had been home often for vacations and weekends, but over this, but after this, a biannual visit would be as much as could be hoped for. You needn't let what Mrs. Harmon says worry you, said Diana, with the calm assurance of the four years matron. Married life has its ups and downs, of course. You mustn't expect that everything will always go smoothly, but I can assure you that it's a happy life when you're married to the right man. Anne smothered a smile. Diana's airs of vast experience always amused her a little. I dare say I'll be putting them on too when I've been married four years, she thought. Surely my sense of humor will preserve me through it from it, though. Is it settled yet where you're going to live? Asked Diana, cuddling small Cordelia with the inimitable gesture of motherhood, which always sent through Anne's heart filled with sweet, unnuttered dreams and hopes, a thrill that was half pure pleasure and half a strange ethereal pain. Yes, that was what I wanted to tell you when I phoned to you to come down today. By the way, I can't realize that we really have telephones in Avonlea now. It sounds so preposterously up to date, and modernish for this darling, leisurely old place. We can thank the ABIS for them, said Diana. We should never have got the line if they hadn't taken the matter up and carried it through. There was enough cold water thrown to discourage any society, but they stuck to it nevertheless. You did a splendid thing for Avonlea when you founded that society, Anne. What fun we did have at our meetings. Will you ever forget the Blue Hall and Judson Parker's scheme for painting medicine advertisements on his fence? I don't know that I'm wholly grateful to the ABIS in the matter of the telephones at Anne. Oh, I know it's most convenient, even more so than our old device of signaling to each other by flashes of candlelight. And as Mrs. Rachel says, Avonlea must keep up with the procession, that's what. But somehow I feel as if I didn't want Avonlea spoiled by what Mr. Harrison, when he wants to be witty, calls modern inconveniences. 
I should like to have it kept always just as it was in the dear old years. That's foolish and sentimental and impossible. So I shall immediately become wise and practical and possible. The telephone, as Mr. Harrison concedes, is a buster of a good thing, even if you do know that probably half a dozen interested people are listening along the line. That's the worst of it, sighed Diana. It's so annoying to hear the receivers going down whenever you ring anyone up. They say Mrs. Harmon Andrews insisted that their phone should be put in their kitchen just so that she could listen whenever it rang and keep an eye on the dinner at the same time. Today, when you called me, I distinctly heard that queer clock of the pie striking, so no doubt Josie or Gertie was listening. Oh, so that is why you said you've got a new clock at Green Gables, haven't you? I couldn't imagine what you meant. I heard a vicious click as soon as you had spoken. I suppose it was the pie receiver being hung up with profane energy. Well, never mind the pies. As Mrs. Rachel says, pies they always were and pies they always will be, world without end, amen. I want to talk of pleasanter things. It's all settled as to where my new home shall be. Oh, Anne, where? I do hope it's near here. No, that's the drawback. Gilbert is going to settle at Four Winds Harbor, 60 miles from here. 60? It might as well be 600, sighed Diana. I never can get further from home now than Charlottetown. You'll have to come to Four Winds. It's the most beautiful harbor on the island. There's a little village called Glen St. Mary at its head, and Dr. David Blythe has been practicing there for 50 years. He is Gilbert's great uncle, you know. He's going to retire, and Gilbert is to take over his practice. Dr. Blythe is going to keep his house, though, so we shall have to find a habitation for ourselves. I don't know yet what it is or where it will be in reality, but I have a little house of dreams all furnished in my imagination. A tiny, delightful castle in Spain. Where are you going for your wedding tour? asked Diana. Nowhere. Oh, don't look horrified, Diana, dearest. You suggest Mrs. Harmon Andrews. She no doubt will remark condescendingly that people who can't afford wedding towers are real sensible not to take them. And then she'll remind me that Jane went to Europe for hers. I want to spend my honeymoon at Four Winds in my own dear house of dreams. And you've decided not to have any bridesmaids? There isn't anyone to have. You and Phil and Priscilla and Jane all stole a march on me in the matter of marriage. And Stella is teaching in Vancouver. I have no other kindred soul and I won't have a bridesmaid who isn't. But you are going to wear a veil, aren't you? Asked Diana anxiously. Yes, indeedy. I shouldn't feel like a bride without one. I remember telling Matthew that evening when he brought me to Green Gables that I never expected to be a bride because I was so homely. No one would ever want to marry me unless some foreign missionary did. I had an idea then that the foreign missionaries couldn't afford to be finicky in the matter of looks if they wanted a girl to risk her life among cannibals. You should have seen the foreign missionary Priscilla married. He was as handsome and inscrutable as those daydreams we once planned to marry ourselves. He was the best dressed man I ever met and he raved over Priscilla's ethereal golden beauty. But of course, there are no cannibals in Japan. Your wedding dress is a dream anyhow, sighed Diana rapturously. You'll look like a perfect queen in it. You're so tall and slender. How do you keep so slim, Anne? I'm fatter than ever. I'll soon have no waist at all. Stoutness and slimness seem to be matters of pre predestination, said Anne. At all events, Mrs. Harmon Andrews can't say to you what she said to me when I came home from Summerside. Well, Anne, you're just about as skinny as ever. It sounds quite romantic to be slender, but skinny has a very different tang. Mrs. Harmon has been talking about your tr trousseau. She admits it's as nice as Jane's, although she says Jane married a millionaire and you are only marrying a poor doctor without a cent to his name. Anne laughed. My dresses are nice. I love pretty things. I remember the first pretty dress I ever had, the black brown Gloria Matthew gave me for our school concert. Before that, everything I had was so ugly. It seemed to me that I stepped into a new world that night. That was the night Gilbert recited Blingin' on the Rhine and looked at you when he said, there is another, not a sister. And you were so furious because he put your pink tissue rose in his breast pocket. You didn't imagine then that you would ever marry him. Oh, well, that's another instance of predestination, laughed Anne as they went down the garret stairs. Chapter Two, The House of Dreams. There was more excitement in the air of Green Gables than there had ever been before in all its history. Even Marilla was so excited that she couldn't help showing it, which was little short of being phenomenal. There's never been a wedding in this house, she said half apologetically to Mrs. Rachel Lynde. When I was a child, I heard an old minister say that a house was not a real home until it had been con consecrated by a birth, a wedding, and a death. We've had deaths here. My father and mother died here as well as Matthew, and we've even had a birth here. Long ago, just after we moved into this house, we had a married hired man for a little while, and his wife had a baby here. 
but there's never been a wedding before. It does seem so strange to think of Anne being married. In a way, she seems to me the little girl Matthew brought home here 14 years ago. I can't realize that she's grown up. I shall never forget that I, what I felt when I saw Matthew bringing in a girl. I wonder what became of the boy we would have got if there hadn't been a mistake. I wonder what his fate was. Well, it was a fortunate mistake, said Mrs. Rachel Lynde. Though, mind you, there was a time I didn't think so. That evening I came up to see Anne and she treated us to such a scene. Many things have changed since then, that's what. Mrs. Rachel sighed and then brisked up again. When weddings were in order, Mrs. Rachel was ready to let the dead past bury its dead. I'm going to give Anne two of my cotton warp spreads, she resumed. A tobacco stripe one and an apple leaf one. She tells me they're getting to be real fashionable again. Well, fashion or no fashion, I don't believe there's anything prettier for a spare room bed than a nice apple leaf spread. That's what. I must see about getting them bleached. I've had them sewed up in cotton bags ever since Thomas died, and no doubt they're an awful color. But there's a month yet, and dew bleaching will work wonders. Only a month, Norla sighed and then said proudly, I'm giving Anne that half dozen braided rugs I have in the garret. I never supposed she'd want them. They're so old fashioned, and nobody seems to want anything but hooked mats now. But she asked me for them. She said she'd rather have them than anything else for her floors. They are pretty. I made them of the nicest rags and braided them in stripes. It was such a company these last few winters, and I'll make her enough blue plum preserve to stock her jam closet for a year. Seems real strange. Those blue plum trees hadn't even a blossom for three years, and I thought they might as well be cut down. And this last spring, they were white, and such a crop of plums I never remember at Green Gables. Well, thank goodness that Anne and Gilbert really are going to be married after all. It's what I've always prayed for, said Mrs. Rachel in the tone of one who was comfortably sure that her prayers have availed much. It was a great relief to find out that she really didn't mean to take the king's port man. He was rich, to be sure, and Gilbert is poor, at least to begin with, but then he's an island boy. He's Gilbert Blythe, said Marilla contentedly. Marilla would have died the death before she would have put into words the thought that was always in the background of her mind whenever she had looked at Gilbert from his childhood up. The thought that, had it not been for her own willful pride long, long ago, he might have been her son. Marilla felt that, in some strange way, his marriage with Anne would put right that old mistake. Good had come out of the evil of the ancient bitterness. As for Anne herself, she was so happy that she almost felt frightened. The gods, so says the old superstition, do not like to behold two happy mortals. It is certain, at least, that some human beings do not. Two of that ilk descended upon Anne in one violent dusk, one violet dusk and proceeded to do what in them lay to prick the rainbow bubble of her satisfaction. If she thought she was getting any particular prize from young Dr. Blythe, or if she imagined that he was still as infatuated with her as he might have been in his salad days, it was surely their duty to put the matter before her in another light. Yet these two worthy ladies were not enemies of Anne. On the contrary, they were quite fond of her and would have defended her as their own young had anyone else attacked her. Human nature is not obliged to be consistent. Mrs. Inglis, nay, Jane Andrews, to quote from the Daily Enterprise, came with her mother and Mrs. Jasper Bell, but in Jane the milk of human kindness had not been curdled by years of matrimonial bickerings. Her lines had fallen in pleasant places. In spite of the fact, as Mrs. Rachel Lynde would say, that she had married a millionaire, her marriage had been happy. Wealth had not spoiled her. She was still the placid, amiable, pink-cheeked Jane of the old quartet, sympathizing with her old chum's happiness, and as keenly interested in all the dainty details of Anne's trousseau as if it could rival her own silken and bejeweled splendors. Jane was not brilliant and had probably never made a remark worth listening to in her life, but she never said anything that would hurt anyone's feelings, which may be a negative talent, but is likewise a rare and enviable one. <coughs> <coughs> so Gilbert didn't go back on you after all, said Mrs. Harmon Andrews, contriving to convey an expression of surprise in her tone. Well, the Blythes generally keep their word when they've once passed it, no matter what happens. Let me see, you're 25, aren't you, Anne? When I was a girl, 25 was the first corner. But you look quite young. Red-headed people always do. Red hair is very fashionable now, said Anne, trying to smile but speaking rather coldly. Life had developed in her a sense of humor, which helped her over many difficulties. But as yet, nothing had availed to steal her against a reference to her hair. So it is, so it is, conceded Mrs. Harmond. There is no telling what queer freaks fashion will take. Well, Anne, your things are very pretty and very suitable to your position in life, aren't they, Jane? I hope you'll be very happy. You have my best wishes, I'm sure. A long engagement doesn't often turn out well, but of course, in your case, it couldn't be helped. 
Gilbert looks very young for a doctor. I'm afraid people won't have much confidence in him, said Mrs. Jasper Bell gloomily. Then she shut her mouth tightly as if she had said what she considered it her duty to say and held her conscience clear. She belonged to the type which always had a, a stringy black feather in its hat and straggling locks of hair on its neck. Anne's surface pleasure in her pretty bridal things was temporarily shadowed, but the deeps of happiness below could not thus be disturbed, and the little stings of Madame Bell and Andrews were forgotten when Gilbert came later, and they wandered down to the birches of the brook, which had been saplings when Anne had come to Green Gables, but were now tall ivory columns in a fairy palace of twilight and stars. In their shadows, Anne and Gilbert talked in lover fashion of their new home and their new life together. I found a nest for us, Anne. Oh, where? Not right in the village, I hope. I wouldn't like that altogether. No, there was no house to be had in the village. This is a little white house on the harbor shore, halfway between Glen St. Mary and Four Winds Point. It's a little out of the way, but when we get a phone in that, it won't matter so much. The situation is beautiful. It looks to the sunset and has the great blue harbor before it. The sand dunes aren't very far away. The sea winds blow over them and the sea spray drenches them. But the house itself, Gilbert, our first home, what is it like? Not very large, but large enough for us. There's a splendid living room with a fireplace in its downstairs and a dining room that looks out onto the harbor and a little room that will do for my office. It is about 60 years old the oldest house in Four Winds, but it has been kept in pretty good repair and was all done over about 15 years ago, shingled, plastered, and refloored. It was well built to begin with. I understand that there was some romantic story connected with its building, but the man I rented it from didn't know it. He said Captain Jim was, Jim was the only one who could spin that old yarn now. Who is Captain Jim? The keeper of the lighthouse on Four Winds Point. You'll love that Four Winds light, Anne. It's a revolving one, and it flashes like a magnificent star through the twilights. We can see it from our living room windows and our front door. Who owns the house? Well, it's the property of the Glen St. Mary Presbyterian Church now, and I rented it from the trustees, but it belonged until lately to a very old lady, Miss Elizabeth Russell. She died last spring, and as she had no near relatives, she left her property to the Glen St. Mary Church. Her furniture is still in the house, and I bought most of it, for a mere song, you might say, because it was all so old-fashioned that the trustees despaired of selling it. Glen St. Mary folks prefer plush brocade and sideboards with mirrors and ornamentations, I fancy, but Miss Russell's furniture is very good, and I feel sure you'll like it, Anne. So far, good, said Anne, nodding cautious approval. But Gilbert, people cannot live by furniture alone. You haven't yet mentioned one very important thing. Are there trees about this house? Heaps of them. Oh, Dryad. There's a big grove of fir trees behind it, two rows of Lombardy poplars down the lane, and a ring of white birches around a very delightful garden. Our front door opens right into the garden, but there's another entrance, a little gate hung between two firs. The hinges are on one trunk and the catch on the other. Their boughs form an arch overhead. Oh, I'm so glad. I couldn't live where there were no trees. Something vital in me would starve. Well, after that, there's no use asking you if there's a brook anywhere near. That would be expecting too much. But there is a brook, and it actually cuts across one corner of the garden. Then, said Anne with a long sigh of supreme satisfaction, this house you have found is my house of dreams and none other.